Thank you, Linda. Great message that we all need to hear today. You know, no matter where we are in the journey, no matter what we're going through, I'm thankful that he said he would never leave us nor forsake us. He's That's awesome. If you were not here uh, last week, I started a series that I'm calling Life Stage. Life Stages that, that we go through. And Life Stages are the different levels of our spiritual growth that we go through as we grow closer to the Lord. And I want to see how well you listened if you were here last week. I want to see if you remember without looking at any notes in your Bible, if you remember, um, the four stages. What was the first one? The... Seeker. The process and what we talked about was spiritual growth. I mean, think about it. You can't go with God and stay where you're at. Because He's transforming us. He's continually to work with us, you know. And some of us, you know, it takes a little bit more time, but there's a process. He's trying to make me and take me where He needs and wants me to be. But this is the first one. So I, And the goal is for us to go through this process as the Lord calls and works and works in our life. So we go from seeker, step across the line of faith, to a follower. Follower of Jesus Christ. The next one, we go from there to a, remember, the, start with the no. You're owning it, you're an owner. Okay? Seeker, follower, to the owner. And owning it means that I'm going to work with my, I'm going to take ownership for my own spiritual growth. And from owner, the next step in the process is a, remember it starts with an R? Reproducer. A reproducer. A reproducer. So those are the four things. And I guarantee that in even a small crowd like we have today, that all four of these stages are represented. What I want to do through this process is to help you define where are you personally. I want to help you to understand the relationships to those who aren't in or where I'm at spiritually. Because I find that we're in all different places. Well, how do I understand you where you're at and how do you understand me and where I'm at? Because we're in all different places. We just are. And then I want to help us, no matter where you're at, is how can I grow closer to God through these stages? And this morning we're going to look at the first one, which is the seeker, the first part of that. And I want to uh, look at it by basically asking some questions uh, about the seeker, that first stage. You have sermon notes, uh, you're welcome to take those and uh, grab a pencil and let's get started. Here's the first one. I want to ask this question, who is a seeker? So that we're all on the same page together when you understand, remember, hear that word, the seeker. And again, it's a part of the process and I want everybody to be on the same page. When it comes to who is a seeker, here's the first thing in your notes. A seeker is someone who is not yet in a relationship with Jesus Christ. This person, for whatever reason, has not yet dedicated their life to Jesus Christ. They might be atheist, they might be agnostic, they might be something else. They might or they might not attend a church. They might be very old, they might be very young, or somewhere in between. This seeker or a seeker may have heard of Jesus Christ before, or maybe they have not heard ever about Jesus Christ. But the one thing that a seeker has in common is they have never taken the step of commitment that is necessary to be considered a follower of Jesus Christ. They just have not taken that step. You know what? I used to be there. You all used to be there. You were investigating, you were seeking the claims of Christ, you were seeking, who is God? You were seeking some answers to some questions that you have, but there was this line right there. I've never seen Hook or Peter Pan. I remember him in a, in a movie, he took and he took a sword and he took it across the ground and all the kids were standing there and he says, alright, who believe that I am Peter Pan? Step across the line. You and the kids are debating whether to stop across the line, you know. I mean, isn't that what it is? There's a line of faith that says, yes, I believe. And the seeker is trying to investigate. At some point, again in the process, they say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me. But there's a process. But for whatever reason, they've not made that commitment. 
Here's a, a second thing about a seeker. A seeker is someone who is consciously or unconsciously looking for God. This is where the term seeker comes in. They're usually looking for answers, especially in the spiritual realm. Every, every cultural indicator that you look at today will tell you that people, especially the younger generation, uh, it, it's interesting, you might think, seriously? That the younger generation, they say, is more, they're more uh, open to spiritual things than generations before. They're very open to it. As a matter of fact, they're more open to it than any other generation in history. A few years ago, there was a rock group, a rock group called REM. They had a song that was called Losing My Religion. Here's a couple of the, the lyrics that they had in there. It says, every day, every waking hour, I'm choosing my confession. In many ways, this REM group, not one of my favorites, but they sang years ago and and it was one of those things where in some ways they were speaking for the generation of spiritual seekers who were saying, I'm sick of religion. But they knew the value of relationships. They were in the spiritual marketplace. They were choosing which confession of faith met their needs. See, people today are beginning to tap into spirit, uh, to the spiritual dimension like never before. Now notice, I didn't say that they were tapping into Christianity like they did before. But they're open to very different forms of spirituality. Um, sorry. Got the pages mixed up. Some are searching for, some of people are searching in Eastern religions. Uh, my, my neighbor, a friend of mine, was was searching for answers, but he was looking all over the place. And one of those was Eastern religions. Some people are looking into New Age teachings. Some people are just looking into various types of religious experience that kind of meets their needs or fulfill their needs. Now, whether these people are looking into Christianity for their answers or not, the bottom line is they're looking. They're searching for answers. And that's what I mean when I say they're consciously or subconsciously, they're looking for God. They're open to experiencing whatever will bring them fulfillment. We know what will bring them fulfillment. My hope is that you will look and look. The scripture says, seek me with all your heart and find me. The Lord wants you to find him. But that, that's people in our day. That's seekers looking. They're wanting to know God. They're wanting to know answers. But there's someone who's consciously or subconsciously looking for God. So that's who a seeker is. Let me share the second question, and that is this. What does a seeker need to know? I don't take for granted that even in a church our size, that every time we get together, that we're all followers, owners, reproducers. There are times, and there may be even someone here. I, I met someone, talked to them just last week, and they told me basically the fact that they didn't become Christians till late in their life, but they'd been to church many times. Or they, what was she saying? She was saying we were seekers. We didn't step across the line of faith, but we were there. So there may be someone here this morning <coughs> in our midst who would say, you're talking about me. I've not crossed that line of faith, but I am seeking the Lord. I'm seeking God. I'm seeking to know all these things. And I want to say if that's you this morning, I'm glad that you're here. And I pray that you'd be open and willing to hear the things not only that Christianity, that Christ has to offer you, but what you have to offer to Him. Now, what I'm going to share, I'm going to share these real quick with you. It might sound a little intense, and guess what? It should. Because when you're talking about a relationship to and with the God of the universe, guess what? It ought to shake us a little bit. There ought to be a little bit of fear. You see this shaking? There ought to be fear. Uh, and we need to look long and hard about the world in our place. In it. Let me give you three truths that you need to know. If you're a seeker this morning, or I know that many of you may have someone in your family, a neighbor, a friend that you know is a seeker. They've not yet crossed that line. Here's some truths you need to hear as a seeker. The first one is this. God is searching for you. God is the hound of heaven. He is right here searching for you. And as you're searching for him, you need to know that he's on the lookout for you. 
Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God in the flesh, came from heaven to this planet basically for one reason, and that was to seek you and find you to offer you the greatest gift ever given to mankind. He was after you alone. If there were just you and 99 were saved, the scripture says he would have left the 99 to go find you. Luke 19.10 says this, For the Son of Man, for Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to circle two words, seek and save. Because there's a dual purpose here. Jesus wants to find you if you're a seeker. He wants to save you if you're a seeker. He wants to locate the deepest doubts, the hurts, the misunderstandings, the mistrusts. And through the miracle of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and through his death and resurrection, he wants to make you as a seeker whole. See, if we could only see that God is right here, he's in the midst of us today. He is right here walking through every pew, and he wants to minister to you no matter where you are. No matter what you're going through, he wants to help you right now. He's not hiding from you. He's here right now, and he's ready to help you, to give you the wholeness and the security that you need not only in this life, but the life to come. I like how John Scott put it this way. He said, our greatest claim to nobility is our created capacity to know God, to be in personal relationship with him, to love him and worship him. Indeed, we are most truly human when we are on our knees before God. See, we were created for a relationship. He is looking for you as a seeker, and you need to know that, that God is searching for you. Here's the second truth, and that is this. God is giving you a window of opportunity. There's just this time. See, Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. I want you to underline the same word twice. It's the word while. What does that mean? It's just for a time. It's just for this amount of time. You know, that basically, I'm not trying to, I don't think it's a good way to do it anyway. I'm not trying to manipulate. I'm not trying to scare anybody that would say, hey, I'm a seeker. Because you can't, it, it's not done well that way. You can't scare someone into a decision. It has to be a willing decision. But when you look at the lifespan of man, do you know that the average lifespan of man is 70 years? The average lifespan for a woman is 80? And, you know, we have these 70 or 80 years, and we have this span of time while he may be found, and while he is near, we need to call on him. And so we don't know, again, when he's going to come back. We have this moment in time. And you have every right to have all your questions answered when it comes to the claims of Christ. You want to have solid evidence of who Jesus is. You know what? You can ask for that. But let me say that you need to take the time to personally investigate the claims of Christ. To do the research necessary in a reasonable time frame. Because why? Because not one of us, including me, has the guarantee of tomorrow. This may be it. This may be the last day for you and for me. But see, on top of that, the sooner that you begin this relationship, the sooner you step across that line of faith that, that God is offering to you, then you can fulfill and help those who were at the same place you were. And you can fulfill your mission here in this, in this lifetime, in this earth. Here's another thing, that, another truth you need to know, is God's ready to accept you right now, in this moment. See, God is so amazing. He's made each one of us as free moral agents. You chose to come here this morning. You had the freedom to make the choice. You have the freedom and the choice to be for God or be against Him. It's really up to us. In addition, He is willing to accept us uh, into an intimate relationship no matter you know, where we're at or what we have or the baggage or anything. He's ready to... For you to choose him if you're ready. He doesn't twist your arm. God doesn't work this way. He doesn't push you over the line. He invites you. Uh, he just gives us the answers and he gives you and I the opportunity. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. It says this. God says, at just the right time, I heard you. 
uh, on the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, God is ready to help you right now. Today is the day of salvation. See, he's not saying to the seeker that basically you need to get your act together before you turn and come to me. He's saying, he's not holding back saying you need to get rid of all your old habits or bad habits before you come to me. He's saying, no, I'll take you right where you're at with everything you have to offer. Just turn to me. And he's not worried about where you're at today. He's just wanting to help take you where you need to be in the process. See, whenever you're ready as a seeker, God's ready for you. And you need to understand that. Here's the third basic question I want to ask today, and that is this. We've talked about who a seeker is. We've talked about what a seeker needs to know. But you need to understand how I can influence seekers. See, a seeker is going to come and say, why do you want to influence me? Why is this so important? They need to understand. As a seeker, you need to understand. But as well, we have seeker friends and family. So what can I do to help? The reason we want to influence a seeker is because we believe that without Jesus Christ in your life, without Him being your Lord and Savior, my friends, there is no hope. That's why we want to influence the believer, because that's what we believe. In addition, we know that from personal experience, we know how much better your life will be once you make that decision and you receive His blessings, you receive salvation, you receive His Spirit in your life. Guess what? Isn't life grand? Because you have His peace that passes all understanding. You have His joy in the midst of the storms. You have His comfort. You have all these blessings because you've stepped across the line of faith. And that's why we would want every seeker to have that same faith. And on top of that, we're adopted through being born again, through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We are adopted into the family of God. And God the Father wants more children. He wants all people to come to faith in Him. And so therefore, that's why we've been influenced. <coughs> Let me share. To experience God's love, that is our greatest need. To influence others toward that experience is our greatest purpose. Let me share with you, how can I be an influence? How can I influence a seeker? Why do we want to influence if you are a seeker? Here it is. First one is be loving. Be loving. This is both the number one in the order that I'm going to give you, and it's also the number one is as far as importance. You and I cannot be an influence to any other person in our life if we don't love them, and they don't recognize that it's true love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3, the message version of the Bible says this. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic efficacy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a, of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all the mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to the mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. You know, it's real easy for my wife to love me. <laughs> and it's real easy to love my wife. I love her. I love my kids. I love my friends. But you know what the test is? Do I love that seeker? Do I say, well, I only love you if you do this for me? <laughs> I only love you if you do what I say or what I think you should do. I'll love you then. You know, the, one of the greatest things in my life was my mom and dad's love. Because in high school, I was making some pretty poor choices. I knew they didn't agree, but I was making some really bad choices. And I broke their hearts. You know what? They could have chosen to say, I don't love you. But it was their love that helped me in that process. Because, you know, that's what true love. I'm going to love you through this. We have to love. See, the secret of being able to truly love anyone you meet is being found. It is truly 
How do you do that? I'm truly in love with Jesus. So therefore, since I love him, I can love you. And as I become more like him, I'm not only becoming more morally like him, you know, making <laughs> right and wrong decisions, but I begin to emulate and express his compassion to everybody in this world. So you have to understand that Jesus spent more of his majority of his time with this group of people, the seekers. You know, a lot of times we think that Jesus spent his time with the disciples and always the disciples. Well, yeah, he did. But the majority of his time, think about it. He's out in the crowd. And he's walking by and he sees this little guy up in the tree that everybody hated and didn't like. And he cheated you out of his money. His name was Zacchaeus. And he sees Zacchaeus and he says, I'm, I want to go to your house today. What's he saying? You matter to me. He was, what was he doing? He was seeking to see this person who was named Jesus that he'd heard about. And Jesus pointed him out. And this man's life, Zacchaeus, was changed. I'll give back four times the amount of everybody I cheated. But it's because Jesus loved him when, it, when no one else would. One of the greatest complaints that was leveled at Jesus was by the religious leaders of his day. They said he's hanging out with sinners. See, I think he was hanging out with people that were open to what he had to say. No, they hadn't crossed the line of faith, but he was hanging out with them. His greatest demonstrations, when you look at Scripture, his greatest demonstrations of love were to those who were not yet in relationship with his Father. I think we need to learn from that. So we need to be loving. The second thing is just be real. Be real. You know, we all have been given uh, God-given personalities. Some of them are very irritating, and some of them are real great. I'm probably one of the irritating ones. But we have great personalities. And basically, we just have to be ourselves. Um, when it comes to being real, you have to share with your seeker friends basically this. You know, you, they need to know that you have security. They need to know that you have peace and you have all these blessings, but they need to know that you're not perfect. They need to know that you don't have all the answers. They need to know that you love them and you're just you. And the only difference between them and you is the fact that God's on my side. I want him to be on your side. He's helping me through life and he can help you too. You just have to be real with him. Here's the other thing. How can I be an influence? How about be patient? Be patient. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16 says this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, he says. But for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example. For those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. I want you to underline, if you're using notes, Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example. See, J Jesus has been patient with me. He was patient with me when I was when I couldn't decide or where I was at when I was first making that move as a seeker. I get to be a follower, and guess what? He's still going to be patient with you as you take the steps and you go through the journey. Thank the Lord that he's patient. We too need to be patient with those who are seeking. We need to be patient with them. The greatest example is Jesus being patient with us. See, we cannot expect someone who's a seeker, who may not be familiar with the Christian faith, to automatically be, to embrace it and to stand for everything that it counts for. Because see, that's just not where they're at. But we need to be patient with them. For many seekers, if not, they haven't heard about Jesus, and they haven't heard those things. And, and to think about committing to what you've been committed to is foreign language. But it's the most important decision. I remember a friend of mine, uh, a pastor friend, he was basically praying for his dad. His dad did not know Jesus, and as a matter of fact, he says, when we'd go home and we would talk, uh, I'd try to share Christ with him, and he says, I don't want to hear it. And so he Okay. But he says, I would pray and I would cry and I'd beg God to save my dad. And for years I prayed that prayer and he says, finally, I just stopped begging. Because God wants him to be saved more than I do. But he says, I just prayed and I just said, I'm not going to beg. And I remember he says, he remember telling the story, he says, my dad got sick. So I go to the hospital, flew in to go see him and he's in the hospital. He said, son, I want to hear about you, Jesus. 
So he's able to share Christ with his father. His father made a commitment says, I want to receive Christ in my life. God kept his promise. But the bottom line is you have to be patient and understand that God wants that seeker to be saved more than you do. But we need to pray for them to be patient. And here's another one. Be bold. Be bold. You know, I'm, not, I'm talking about just being willing to share. Uh, to communicate. Um, not Bible bash. That doesn't work. Just be bold. In other words, when you get the opportunity, as 1 Peter 3.15, this gives us the best way to do it. As a, as a follower, as a, an owner and a reproducer, it's always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You need to underline gentleness and respect. See, when you're over here and you're a reproducer and they're way back there, you're like, come on, you know, you want them to be here. But it takes time and you not only need to be patient, but you need to speak gently and with respect to help them. Uh, it's just what we have to do. But be bold. This is who I was before Christ. Since Jesus came into my life, this is where I'm at. It's the greatest thing. And I want to help you. This is awesome over here. Come and join me. But be bold. Because we have the greatest relationship in the world. We have the greatest gift in the world. We want to let somebody know. We don't want to just go bang and just push it on the I'm ready to share it if I have that opportunity. Let me share this in conclusion. That the goal of this series is to help you to understand where am I at in this process? What stage am I at? And to help you to relate to those who are at different stages. And then to assist you. Where am I at and how can I go? What steps do I need to take? Because you want to move from seeker to follower to owner to reproducer. But let me say that the seeker stage is probably the hardest and also the easiest. Why is the seeker stage so hard? Think about it. If you're here and you have received Christ, think about that time when you did. Why is it so hard to step across the line of faith? Why is it so hard? Because I believe that it, it takes a lot of guts to stand up and say, I'm a follower of Christ. Now, why is it so hard? Because not everybody's going there. In addition, you need to make sure that you're ready to make a life-changing commitment. It's just not a one-time commitment. It's a continual process to be what it is. You can't look in the face of God and accept His gift and stay where you're. You can't. So it's a big commitment. So that's why it's so hard. That's why when the altar time comes or the response time you know, you're holding on to the pew as a seeker. You're like, I don't know if I can do this. But you know what? Let me tell you, the first step is always the hardest. But after that, let go and let God. Why is it so hard? When all you have to do is say no to self and yes to Jesus. But if you are a seeker here this morning, I would say God is searching for you. God has given you a window of opportunity. God is ready to accept you right where you're at. This is what I want to do. I want everybody to stand for just a moment. I want you to stand before we go and we'll have a time to see you. But I want to make this easy. We're not going to play any music. But if there is anyone here that says, hey, I'm a seeker, and right now I feel the Lord's knocking on my heart, and I feel like I'm to do something. I'm going to take a step of faith and accept Christ in my life. I want to give you that opportunity to just step out by faith and come and join me so we can celebrate with you on the decision that you've made to accept Jesus in your life. And if that's you, step out right now and come and join me. I can't preach a sermon like this and not give an opportunity. So if there's anybody, just step out and come and join me. Here's the thing. Everybody in this room, for the most part, is probably totally convinced. But there's so many that are searching. And we have the greatest answer and person in the world to share about. Let's pray for a moment. And then we'll have time to communicate. Father, thank you that you call us. You're the hound of heaven. 
Thank you that you're seeking us and that you want to save us. And Lord, we may be here today and we're way past that. We're a long ways in the journey, and that's great. But Lord, we know a lot of people that aren't. So I pray that we seriously pray for them, that the walls would be broken down, that they would come to faith in you. They'd make the greatest decision, because without you, they're lost. You don't want them to be lost, we don't want them to be lost. So thank you that you provided a way. And Lord, as we come to this time of communion, we remember your sacrifice. We remember the gift that you gave to us. Remember that you died in our place. And the fact that you rose again to bring us hope, not only for the life to come, but hope for the day in which we live, that your presence is right here, right now, and in this moment. Thank you for being the seeker, the hound of heaven coming to us. Help us to take steps toward you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm asking those.